So, Gordon, thanks for coming on the show, and uh, can't thank you enough. Did you have a good Labor Day weekend? You know, nowadays it's it's uh, you know with this whole quarantine thing. You know, I don't even know if it's a quarantine anymore. It's you know people are doing what they want to do. I mean, we're such a divided country right now. Um, we're pretty much home. Um, we did go down to the beach, but we definitely want to avoid the crowds more than ever. I like avoiding crowds anyway. But now, especially, uh, we so we hung around the house. You know, we planted gardens this year. I put a patio on the back of my house. You know, I've done so much around the house stuff, as many people, you know, Lowe's did and Home Depot did very well this year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's where I am. I'm home a lot. I've got two small children, you know. So, you know, that's where I am. But, yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree. I, I I think in this last year, especially with the quarantine, I, I fixed so many doors and we patched so many holes in the wall. And I did a little bit of gardening myself, um, trying to start that out. I don't think we have the right environment, maybe. I think I'm... Yeah, the wife loves it. I mean, if they love the honeydew list, this actually works out for that, uh, which, you know... Yeah, the, the lantern flies over in our way here in uh, Pennsylvania. They they got our watermelons, they got our cucumbers, and they got our uh, our squash pretty good. But the tomatoes came in well, and so we we did okay. Yeah. We're happy. Yeah. So Gordon Del Giorno, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, Del Giorno. Awesome. So you're a filmmaker, and uh, previous well, first I thought you were based out of Delaware. You're in Pennsylvania now. Well, I'm close to Delaware. Delaware's my home state, um, and uh, but I'm about 25 minutes now into Pennsylvania. Delaware's always had a knock on not having very good public schools. So, and uh, you know, I love Delaware, and I wish they would fix their system over there. But so everybody sort of comes over the PA line, pays more taxes for the schools uh, because it's really uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, set, you know, you got like something like eight school districts there. So in a small state that you can get from top to bottom in an hour and 15 minutes. So it's just, it's kind of really uh, needs help. So yeah. that's why we're here. I still love Delaware. I do my business out of there. I do a lot of filming out of there. But, so I, I don't want to sound like I'm bad mouth in the school system. It's just a really, uh, it's, it's a tough, tough thing there. Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah, me and the wife, we moved to a, a different school district just recently because we just recently had a kid. Yeah. So we wanted to you know, start off the family in this pretty good school district that where we're at. So that's why yeah. that's why I was, you know, working overtime and, and, and you know, push, grinding extra hard during this quarantine to find telework and kind of yeah. rework, rework, rework my skill level as far as, you know, live streaming and, and the home right. studio goes and everything that I can do remotely. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it was, it was pretty tricky, you know, and uh, trying to figure out where we're going to fit in the next. Yes. Next, you know, who knows, next decade, how things are going to, you know. Right. You know. Well, um, how about you tell me a little bit about yourself and, and what you do, what you've been up to lately? Well, I've been uh, doing films for 20 years, 20 plus years now. Um, I started off in uh, the late 90s when Clerks, you sort of got big, you know, in the mid 90s or whenever that was. And I, I saw the movie and actually uh, Kevin Smith is, in, you know, out of Red Bank, I think, New Jersey, which is, you know, fairly close to us within a couple, an hour or two. And uh, when I saw it, you know, and I saw Rudimentary, I thought it was, even though I knew nothing about filming at that time, I was like, I, I told my brother, I said, we can do that. Yes, you know, everybody thinks they can, you know, the delusion we have is mm -hmm. just crazy, right? So, you know, we started to do a film because that just made it big. It was made for nothing or very little money. It got money later to really sort of polish it up. You know, but um, and I really like Kevin Smith and what they've done. They've done, I mean, done amazing things. But, uh, you know, I always said, you know, some of the humor and stuff like that. My brother and I were into comedy. And so we thought, let's do something. We think we can be funnier than that. I mean, even though that had moments, it was kind of it was really we thought um, kind of a select audience that really would like that. We wanted to go broader and we, in our wisdom at the time which was you know i put up all, 
all the money I had, bought a camera, and I uh, made a movie called Franks and Wieners, and it was just ridiculous humor, in-your-face humor. We made fun of everybody. You think people are sensitive now. I mean, thank God it's not on, like, YouTube and stuff like that because we have it on VHS, you know. So I'm holding it in the vault, you know. I, I told my wife when I first met her, you know, 15 years ago, she said, oh, you do films? Can I see it? And I go, no. Uh, because we just made so many mistakes and just the, 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 the directing. I knew nothing about directing. And, and back then we had lots of theater actors, especially coming in Delaware. So I didn't, we weren't the mecca of the film world, uh, nor are we now really. And so, um, you know, I had to really uh, get a lot of theater actors and they're, they're very robust. So, um, you know, everything come out came out like this, ah, you know, like way too overacted. And uh, so um, I really look at it and I go, ugh. <laughs> oh, so, uh, but there, was of, there were a lot of fun moments in it. There were a lot of um, really, uh, you know, wonderful moments as some people told us. And still today, the timing, a lot of the comedic timing was there. We just had no money, no budget, nothing. And um, so then I just started really in 2006, decided, you know, that was in year 2000. In 2006, I decided just to really um, go into more video. The internet was coming out uh, with, you know, more YouTubing and stuff like that. I saw that happening. And a lot of businesses in our town could use some video and use that. So we did that. And I, I carved out a business and, and made, you know, more money than I ever made. You know, it wasn't extraordinary money, but it was good. Uh, and I've been doing that ever since with every year, every year I do maybe a film, you know, I, you know, something that I want to do that I think is fun or, um, you know, uh, something that creative that comes i can collaborate with somebody with so i've done a few things uh, a lot of documentary style stuff i do did something called slavery's children which uh, i think has a lot of relevance now uh which got has gotten some play in festivals but my big thing right now is i'm trying to um uh do bottle versus can if you i don't know if you read on our site or saw anything a friend of mine came up to me about two years ago uh, that I went to high school with. And he said, uh, you know, I'm thinking about doing this film. I'm, I'm going to do it on my beer can collection. And I'm like, who gives a shit? You know, I mean, and I'm thinking to myself, I guess I need to work. I always, you know, I always need some, like the next gig, you know, to get paid the bills. So, and he, you know, I went to high school with this guy 35 years ago. And so he, I go, Okay, I'll listen. And he's just, you know, going on and on about this. You know, I sold my beer can collection. I'm like, nobody's going to care other than maybe some beer drinkers about this. Yeah. But he kept talking and I half could hear him because it was a coffee shop that was so loud. And I'm just nodding going, okay, but yeah, pay me a few, few thousand bucks or something. And then I'll, I'll help you make a short film. You know, I was just kind of like, okay, whatever. I'll always listen. Because I'm a producer and I'm always looking for opportunities, but I just never know how they're how they're going to pan out. And I'm still broke, and so <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll listen. And so he started telling me more about the comeback of the beer can. And I go, okay, because you know craft brewers are, are bringing the can back. I said, I always thought canned beer was cheap, like Schlitz or something, or or Miller Lite, or yeah, yeah, Blue Ribbon, or. or, or for peels I drank in high school for five dollars a case. And he goes, Well, he goes, No, craft brewers now are using cans because the millennials want them. And I go, Oh, that's interesting. I said, you know, I'll make it your film, but still it's just like whatever. Who's gonna care? Yeah. What happened? Why would women care about this? Right? You can think about it if you had to think about beer drinkers, yeah, and I'm yeah, you know, not to sound but, but just not chauvinistic, but no, you know, women probably drink more wine or don't drink. Or cocktails. Yeah. Or cocktails, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what it is. It's re reality. So he, he starts to tell me, 
well, you look like a bottle. You're tall and long. I'm short and stumpy. You play the bottle and I'll play the can in this. So then it started to like say, okay, now I got to make myself ridiculous, but I've done that. So we started to put out, I said, I'm going to try to get Sam Calagione from Dogfish, who, if you don't know the beer world, he's sort of this, one of the pioneers of, of craft breweries and Dogfish Head. And, and so I was able to, through some context to get him to agree to an interview. And I said, there's our starting point is we need to get narrative because I do a lot of documentaries because that's, I work backwards. I mean, I'll write a script. I mean, we wrote one recently. But I, I tend to get the story from the players, especially when they're real stories. You know, mm -hmm. people always say, oh, well, let's get the script together. Yeah, you can get talking points, but you got to go for the emotional need. And, you know, who's the player? What's the uh, conflict? Who wins or fails in the end? I mean, it's a three-act play, right? I keep it simple, you know, as a producer, director. That's so I started to... Uh, we got him on board. We got Carol Stout, first female brewer, which I was thought, this is great. Now you got female brewer. Now that we, you know, because I think of markets, because Film Brothers is really a uh, kind of sales and marketing company, sort of with film attached, is what I, the way I, I sort of slayed us. And, um, and so we started to come up with these sort of, I said, okay, so let's get them to tell the story and then we'll act it out like idiots. You know, this bottles and can, but we won't say anything. Because, you know, in independent film, as you probably know, especially newbies, including myself, we try to say too much. Mm -hmm. We try to too, have too clever of dialogue. Everything's yeah. pushed. You know, the nuances aren't there. What I learned early in my career after Franks and Wieners from a, uh, an older theater person, she goes, young people just don't know subtle. You just don't know subtle. And, yeah. and I always just, I always was ingrained in my head about nuances and about you know a reaction that's like you just know somebody is maybe scared or exhausted when they just take a deep breath in a in a scene you see close-ups of this and that's what i think as you get better in the filmmaking you learn mm -hmm. so I, I said we have to have nuances with these bottle and can otherwise it's going to be ridiculous anyway because they see these two idiots because he starts to make a can out of tin it, he wraps it. We get our designer to make it an old style can. You can look it up on Beer Can of Love Story. And uh, so you know what I'm talking about. And I said, but people have to care about these characters. They don't want to see talking heads on these interviews we're going to do with all these beer luminaries. They want to see something that's of interest. And they have to care about the character. It's got to be a love story. He's like, what are you talking about? A love story. I said, the can nobody wants anymore. Nobody cares about the can. Nobody loves the can. The can is lonely. The bottle is an a-hole. <laughs> the bottle rules mm -hmm. the beer world. He's tall, long, dark, and handsome. You can almost call him a dickhead, you know, based on the yes, yes, based very. On the, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. he and he's the net, right? So they mm -hmm. call. Him. So I said he's got to be. They got to be nemesis. Uh, and, 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 and so we said, okay, so we started to craft this, to put it together, uh, this, this story. And we really, it, we worked backwards and every so often I said, we need more. We said, oh, we're done. We got enough. And I like, no, no, we need more narrative because in documentary, it's like, you have to really get a lot. And then in post-production, less is more. Mm -hmm. So but if you don't have enough, then you're kind of screwed. So mm -hmm. I kept going back and saying, we need one more interview. We need one more. We had uh, John Metcalf was, uh, was in it. Was, he's a beer historian. He gave us sort of the facts. And then we, but we had Jeff Lebo who owns 95,000 cans in a Mecca of a home that he made into like a bed and breakfast. This guy's insane, right? Wow. There's the love story, I said, his narrative. But then we showed this sort of about history, this love story. And of course, you know, the bottle had all these babes, the bottle babes, and the can had nothing. And, mm -hmm. and then towards the end, obviously, we want the can to win, hopefully. So uh, it's been real. We had a premiere with 600 people. We packed a place at the Queen in Wilmington. 
we had a stage show with the bottle babes, you know, we had a showdown and now it's bottle versus can and people went nuts on social media because everybody says, has an opinion on. Mm -hmm. And so I said, from a marketing standpoint, we want to push that. So I think this is our, our one possibility to maybe do something big, (laughs) you know, this could be my one hit wonder thing, I think. And that's what I'm really going for going here is with this, this bottle versus can. And now we wrote a new film and we have, we're fully invested with an investor for next year. If we can get out of this COVID thing and be able to have scenes with more than two people. In. So that's kind of where we are. <laughs> Cause we have a couple scenes where there's crowds, you know, there's a bar. I mean, it's bottle versus can. There's gotta be a bar in there, right? With a crowded bar. I mean, how are we gonna, that with all this going on but we have an investor who said i love the idea you know we sign non-disclosures we finished the script the good thing about this whole pandemic is we were able to finish the script for the sec this is the follow-up to the beer can of love story which only 600 people or so have seen the movie and you know we've got really good reviews the beer people love it but even the more women came to the event because it was the love story and we slated it that way so we I think the thing with filmmakers, as you know, um, they're not really, for the most part, salespeople. No, and and, and, and I'm good. Gu- yeah, I'm guilty of that. Yeah, I'm guilty of that myself. Absolutely. Well, that's what I'm saying. They love the creative part. They're geniuses and, and all so many things, but you have to put it out there, and they get caught up in the process, and they love the process. And I have to say that I'm a filmmaker too, and I have gotten to like the process. I don't particularly love it. I don't love anything. I, I just do it out of sort of necessity. I get really exhausted about it. And, and uh, But I'm a producer and I'm a salesperson. And I'm an un- unapologetic salesperson. Mm-hmm. You know, I was criticized 10 years ago when I was part of a, uh, of a film group because uh, I was just a salesperson. Somebody even called me like sham wow guy or something. I said, I'm far from sham wow. Trust me that on that. But I took a lot of criticism in my little Delaware area because, you know, oh, he talks. I said, no, no, I listen. I listen. I can talk, but I listen to what people want and need. And I try to, you know, fill that need. And I'm not in chasing my, you know, my own dream and ego. Like, this is my, this is such a great piece, man. This is my, like, my, my muse and all this. Right. I'm like, look. I have other people that come in. I produce their stuff so they can feel good about themselves when they see 200 people see it at a theater and I help them pack that theater. And I've done that to recover their money, mostly short films. That's mm-hmm. been my formula. And, you know, I, I have to say, you know, it's funny. I'm just, I'm bringing this up. I really resented the fact that people, uh, you know, were, you ever see Tin Man, that movie Tin Man with uh, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, Glenn, do you ever see that movie? Or hear about it. Yeah. It's yeah. old like aluminum siding, right? Mm-hmm. And they were like cheesy sales guys, right? Well, at one point, some guys like investigating them. I forget, I can vaguely remember the movie. But my point is, is that in the movie, Richard Dreyfus confronts the guy in the office, and the guy has like a flashlight. He's like snuck in the office to investigate these tin men selling this stuff. And he goes, You know something? You're lazy. You're just lazy. Like he he was. He was calling him lazy because you won't follow up on a lead. You won't take it to a different, you know, you were, and mo, and I'm not saying people are lazy, trust me. I'm saying, but the general population does not want to sell because they don't like rejection. And they don't, and it's the same, and especially film people because they're like, this is my, I put everything I got into this. And they feel, I think on some subconscious level, the ones that I've experienced, that they're really scared to be rejected because that hurts badly when you put a lot in, in into something, right? right? And I, um, so I just kind of sit back and say, look, I like collaborating and letting everybody else go out there and do their thing. I, I had a couple personal things I did, but most of mine now go into collaborations with other people because I'm just, my ego's not so big that I think I got to be some director of the year or win an Oscar or whatever. And uh, 
but I actually, but I'm also not like a sales whore either. You know? right. I, yeah. I want to feel like I do some quality work for people and I'm not just throwing it out there churning. I, I years ago, let's just say I uh, connected with uh, some people that wanted to do video and thought they could churn it out in a week. We'll get them, sit them down on a Monday. We'll film them. We'll edit it. After doing it on Friday, we get paid next week. The phone. I'm like, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. I tried to tell him. Yeah. This guy was a bit from the underworld, we'll say, right? And, you know, some veiled threats were coming out because he put some money into this, right? And I was just like, look, it just doesn't work that way. And so you had that extreme. That's the sham wow person, right? That I was used to be. <laughs> and yeah. that's sort of who I am. I, I'm sorry to babble. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's great. But no, I, you know, to touch on that marketing, you know, I've seen some unique marketing, you know, tactics. Like, like you said, uh, you know, bottle versus can, a beer can love story. You know, uh, when the first Deadpool, you know, like the ultra violent, you know, hard R superhero movie came out. Deadpool, I think, oh, what year was that, 2015 or 2016 or something, they marketed it, they released it on Valentine's Day, and they marketed it, you know, Deadpool, a love story. And they tr and so they tricked all the girls into wanting their boyfriends to take them to that. Wow. And the boyfriends are like, uh, yeah, sure, of course, absolutely, let's do it. The, 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 I mean, you know, and, and uh, the majority situation was that men knew what it was and women were falling for this love story kind of okay. it's, it's coming out on Valentine's day. They, you know, they put hearts because, you know, in the movie, technically, yeah, there is a love story. His girlfriend is kidnapped or whatever. And you know, he's trying to save her, but you know, it's like these tricky marketing. And also I, um, I forget which purge movie it was. I think it was, the, I think it was definitely the second one where they did like a whole spoof political campaign of them trying to the, the whole trailer was just basically your, your your stereotypical presidential political ad yeah trying to trying to sell the purge and that was the trailer for the movie no 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 spoilers it was just but it was so and then you know they threw in some some you know quick flashy you know violent horror type of imagery towards mm -hmm. the end maybe of this trailer but really it was like a political ad campaign and yeah. that's where that's where i started saying you know I started seeing to myself, okay, there's, there's, there's different production hacks. Jet, and I started expanding, you know, like someone could make a documentary. You know, people started doing, um, and another, and then to, 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 to delve, and I'm kind of rambling, I know, but to delve into that, X-Files did a cops episode. And it's like, they're, they're, they're finding all these different little ways of producing and, and, and telling the same story. It's an X-Files, I think the X-Files episode was about a werewolf, but they shot it as if Fox and Fox and Scully, Mulder and Scully, uh, were being documented by the show Cops. Mm -hmm. And then the whole episode, because both Fox had X-Files and Cops, but it, they kind of did a merge. Yeah. And they did, they did this whole episode like an episode of Cops. And I started thinking, wow, like it's, it's an episode of X-Files. It's shot totally differently. It's, it's produced totally differently. And yeah. then, it, it, which 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 spawned the office, which is like a mockumentary, which spawned, um, and, and so you know, I started, I I started, me and some colleagues started delving into different web series, taking different, taking one sort of production style and doing it for something com completely different, and then kind of flipping flipping that and doing something totally different for this, you know, documentary ma making sci-fi fantasy. You know, superhero stuff, but done in like a documentary style, and then vice versa. You know, you know, more more realistic. You know, um, you know, uh, true life stuff, and doing it in like a comic book way or something like right. that, and, and just kind of flipping it and telling the story differently. And and yeah, like uh, like when you told me about the when, when you told me the bottle versus can, I looked at it. I, I said that that's you know that that can work on so many different levels. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's interesting because, you know, years ago, um, I worked with a writer out of Philadelphia, a guy who wrote sketches and was really, really, I thought, really, uh, really a good writer. And it was, and he said to me, don't mix the genres, Gordon, because it's just, you know, you'll confuse the audience. 
And I think that nowadays people do mix the genres and some have done it well because that's a big risk. And we did that with Beer Can Love Story. We mixed the genres a bit. You know, we have a documentary, we have farce, um, you know, you got some, there's this lighthearted comedy um, and that's tricky. And I told, you know, my partner, Matt Del Pizzo, I told him, look, this is going to be tricky because you can't confuse the audience. We got away with it, I think, because it's very clear who's telling the story. It's the people that are, you know, the, the interviews. We never talk. I said, we can never talk because if we do, it'll totally confuse things mm -hmm. too much. Just shut up and let, let us just be the visuals. So that's what we did. Now, I see a lot of Netflix stuff, as you probably do, and, and different streaming stuff nowadays, and they mix the genres, and it's not good. To me, it's not good. And they, they may be hit shows for marketing reasons, or because they're on Netflix, you know, people will tune in. And But my wife and I start watching some of them and just, I don't know, don't know where they're going with this, where they're trying to be funny and it's farce. And then they're trying to be serious too, you know, and I think that can be confusing. So you have, if you, and, but it's sort of the norm now, I think is people are starting to mix the genres because it's been done. Everything's been done. Everything's been done. Exactly. And I, and, right. and for me, you know, I, I agree. Growing up, it was a Western was a Western. Uh, sci-fi action with sci-fi action. And I think what started blowing people away were independent films that saw, that, look, that looked outside the box. Like, and uh, what, what stands out for me is, a, is, a, is, a, is about a handful of films. Swingers, Reservoir Dogs, um, Blair Witch, and Clerks. Like you said, Clerks. I mean, the whole thing pretty much took, took place inside and outside the convenience store. It was comedy, it was drama, it was love, it was, uh, um, you know, insanity. There was a couple of different, you know, that could be a rom-com, rom easily a rom-com, uh, with, you know, a lot of, like, crazy college humor as well. Um, Reservoir Dogs is a heist film that never shows the heist. Yeah. And, and, and that blew people away. And they kind of, I wouldn't say they were mixing genres then, but they were kind of experimenting with that genre. Mm -hmm. Still within, still within the genre, um, but Blair Witch, Blair Witch took from Spinal Tap, you know. So Spinal Tap was a mockumentary, so they were kind of playing with the genres. It was right. all, it was everything like you, like you mentioned. They were talking to these people, but they had already this fictional story, but it was like fake history, and all these interviews, and then all this, you know, on set found footage, and, and all this footage of following this band during their, you know, their struggles to, you know, keep up with the music industry. And Blair Witch took from that, hey, you know, it's a documentary about a witch, filmmakers, you know, and, and even more so, it's found footage. It was a, it was yeah. a found footage, it was a found footage documentary. Yeah, I did, I did a found footage film. I produced and, and directed it kind of, you know, co-directed it with uh, the writers of uh, the found footage. That became a formula and, you know, I was like, okay, you know, it was it was a gig, you know. I, 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 but you know, they wrote it, and it was like, I don't know how to describe it. They may watch this and not be happy with it, but I, 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 I make no bones about it. I was not. Uh, I disagreed with the writers on a lot of what, not what they wrote, but the delivery and sort of you know, there was a lot of buildup and there needed to be more payoff, you know, because you, you got eye candy. It's a horror film, really, you know, and they had it, but, you know, but they were, they were writers and these were accomplished writers. And I just was like, but I also made films and edited them. And I think a lot of times what I run into when I produce is whether it be a camera person, writers, um, actors, you know, stuff like uh, people like that. I, they've never edited it before and sat down with an editor. And, you know, so I've had camera people. I remember, you know, in 2003, I had a camera person and he would always shoot uh, dirty, as they call it in the industry, 
shooting over the shoulder. He's hitting the shoulder of the subject in the foreground that the person here is talking to when you're getting their close-ups. And I go, look, those, those are cool and all. I said, but let's get it clean too, right? Because in post, I don't know how many times you've seen it where somebody's talking like this. And when you go to the other person, they're completely still and the shoulder is still. And I said, it's real awkward to watch when there's a conversation going back for two minutes. I saw it in Sopranos of all series all the time. They had the worst edits in that show for as good as that show was. And this person was like, well, it won a lot of awards. You know, like I said, it didn't win awards for editing. I can tell you that. Right. Yeah. And so, the, but this person had never edited. He shot a lot of stuff. And until he sat in the editing, because then you can see it when you film, like I know in editing what I need and what I don't need. Yeah. Got to get that. You know, it's not just not basic coverage. You know, you got to think of, but you have to be there. Same thing with actors. Actors, a guy one time, talk about nuances. I did something called 20 Minutes. It was a movie uh, where a guy came up and said he, he wanted to do this movie. It was a 20 minute short. It was called 20 Minutes. And it was about a guy that gets out of jail and he has 20 minutes to get to his brother's house before he disowns him because we've had enough of you. you, you I got you set up for a job. And it was in this um, kind of, he has to run through the streets literally and dodge his past, drug dealers, prostitutes, you know, all this, the, these trappings. Yeah. And in the movie, the guy that comes out of jail, this actor out of Philly, he uh, came up to me two days into the shoot. He said, I don't feel like I'm acting, man. I just don't feel it. Like, Cause he didn't have a ton of lines. I said, dude, you're acting, trust me. I said, it's all about your reactions and the nuances and the feelings. I said, when you're talking to that guy, move, just move your eyes that way. Do, you know, take that breath like you're scared or exhausted or, or helpless, right? When he saw it at the premiere, and the way it was edited together, he was like, man, he was blown away. Yeah. And that was shown at Yale University and it was about recidivism and, you know, and that kind of stuff, people, you know, going back to jail and the reasons for it, it was used in an educational way too. It was one of my proudest pieces, a guy named G. Lloyd Morris, who I wrote a lot with. And I would always tell him less is more, less is more. Yeah. You know, and I just preached the whole time, less is more. He, he was one of the, he was a new writer and he wrote a lot. And I was like, look, you don't need all that, man. You're good. It's like Jerry Maguire. You had me at hello, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Right. So, you know, but with, with actors and people uh, and writers too, and these two writers that did this found footage film, yeah, they had a formula. They were going to get it picked up by somebody just because, I mean, you could give them a blank tape like this and say, here. And they would say, it's found footage? Okay. I mean, I don't want to diminish what they wrote. I thought they wrote a lot of clever stuff. It just... It lacked the punch at the end, I thought. Um, and, and, but they fought me on it. Like, this is our deal. We wrote, I go, okay, just pay me. You pay me for doing it. I'll be yeah. the hot run on this, but, you know. I mean, I, I, but but I, can't, I can't agree with you more. And, I, and I've said this a lot to my colleagues, and, and, me, and me and a couple of my colleagues always about that. So I'm saying, I tell them less is more. Yeah, but, you know, you, we need more lights. And I'm like, no, we don't. My, this light setup right here is this is a perfect light setup for, you know, a bunch of stuff, especially a podcast, a TV show, an interview, a documentary. It's a perfect light setup right here. Right. You know, you know, make some interchangeable curtains, you know, by hand, like a green screen, a white screen, uh, a couple of flags, blah 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 blah. But uh, what? And even and they do it. They do it in the military. It's a formula that works, and a lot of people don't realize it. You know, when I went to basic training, they break you down to build you back up. Right. In, fi in filmmaking, you've got a writer. He had the idea from beginning to end. He sees it in his head. He wrote a script from beginning to middle to end. But when I read that script as a director, I'm going to have something different. When you're reading, you build this movie in your head, just like you would a book, just like you would um, a poem or whatever. You're, you're, you're building this whole universe inside your head. I'm going to build it differently than, than you, Gordon. Would. But, but eventually someone's got to direct. And so an AD would break that script down into puzzle pieces. And then we have to build it back up again into shooting this scene, shooting that scene. So, and on top of less is more, also it's better to have it not needed. 
so like you were saying, um, yeah, sure, give me that shot dirty, but then I want a clean version as well. Right. Do we have time for it? Okay. Uh, during production, what are we going to weigh more on? So I want clean first, and then if we have time, give me dirty. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. have time. Right. And, the, and so I remember there was a, I was AD on a, on a featurette. The director had, you know, this huge elaborate fight scene and stunt where somebody falls down the steps to make matters worse. They fall down the steps, break their neck, running out of time. I, listen, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta move along. We gotta get to our stunt and then call it a day. We gotta get to our stunt, call it a day. Finally, it got to the time we had 30 minutes to shoot the stunt. I said, listen, she throws him, he throws him up against the wall. She elbows him, he falls back. That's all we can do. That's all we can do. Okay, well, let's do it. No, 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 three shots. That's it. He throws her up against the wall. She elbows him. He goes back. Then we pick up the stuff down there. That's it. That's all we got time for. And yeah. by, the, by, the, by the time it was edited, it, it came out just fine. Right. It, wasn't, it wasn't Jackie Chan style. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, a Marvel Cinematic Universe type of fight scene with wires and CGI. But it, okay. but, it, but it told the story. It looked great. It was action-packed. It was suspenseful. And it's just about, um, I don't know where I was going with it. I don't know what my point is. But break it down. Break it down to build it back up. Yeah. And I, less is more with better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So right. it's, you got to get the basics. you got to get the basics. Yeah. And uh, when you don't have a lot of time and, you know, and that's typically, especially with independent filmmaking, is what you don't have a lot of time and money and resources. So you have to really think practical. Yeah. You know, everybody wants this crazy icing on top of the cake, but you got to figure out, okay, we got to make a cake first. So that's eggs, that's flour, that's batter. Yeah. And that's an oven. And yeah. then you can start putting the drizzle on top of that. If you have the time, if you if if you know yeah. if we have the money, if we have the time, but if you're going to make a movie, make a good movie first, and then, you know, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. Like the dialogue, who, who was it? Uh, John Ford was uh, you know did all the John Wayne westerns. John Ford. Uh, I don't know the name. It's kind of just before my time. It's you, know, you know, he he did Searchers and he did. Uh, you know, all those John Wayne Westerns, those famous John Wayne Westerns from the 30s and 40s. And he would just gouge dialogue. Yeah. And it's like, all, all this talking, we're not shooting a play, we're shooting a film. Yeah, it's true. It's I tell people, it's, especially actors that are, are new, you know, they'll come out, a lot of them start in theater and it's just, everything's projection. And, sure. And I tell people, you know, just think of like a, a Clint Eastwood, um, type situation where, you know, you have an actor doing theater and they're just like, I told him I'm coming after him, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I go, you got to take it down here. Like, and they go, I told him I'm coming after him. And I go, you, even lower. Even you're not going to, you're not going to go into that CD bar, you know, in downtown right. Philly talking like that. Right. You know? and and it, I said, think of Clint Eastwood. If yeah. there's anybody that comes down low, it's Clint Eastwood. Right. You know, and it's more realistic and, you know, and it's, you know, it's, and I think a lot of people, even good actors, I've seen, I see, you see it on, 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 on movies and TV shows, they're exchanging lines and you can tell when they're exchanging lines and they're waiting for the other one to talk. And they're just, it's very soap opera like, you know, which is very canned and pushed. Mm -hmm. And people need people cut each other off in conversation. That's how it works in the real world. You know, you got to like, what are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Now that's the hold on here, you know, and people walk around. I mean, there's no, I think Ro I saw Robert, Robert Reed, I guess it was the Brady Bunch guy. I think it's, his name was Robert Reed who played the dad. Mm -hmm. And he, they did a, they showed a test audition like before he got the Brady Bunch for a movie. And they showed all the people that did the audition before him. And everybody was just sort of like this, steadily delivering the lines. And what he did was he got up, he looked at the person, he was like, I just don't know why I'm here. He picked up something, 
And it was just so real, you know? It was so, I mean, you're engaged because you're just following his physical acting. And that was all like an improv almost, you know? That was his own sort of take of how he was gonna deliver this. And I just thought it was brilliant. And it taught me a lot about what I would expect from my actors to do. Also, there's a guy, Craig Heron out of Baltimore who uh, did a lot of animation, but he taught me also, you gotta have something happening in the scene. I don't care if somebody's flicking a pencil like this, you know, something. It, when you're having people exchange dialogue, otherwise it's talking heads. And you see a lot of that where people have these intense conversations, you know, in like indie films, you know, and, you know, it's just like they're boxed in here and there's a, you know, there's a flower over here, you know. So, you know, that kind of stuff takes a lot of uh, pre-thought. But you, a lot of times you got to think on the, on the fly, too, and go, OK, throw something in here. What do you got? You know, you got you got a you got a chair over here. I'm going to break it over here. Throw some old tr trash over there. Go yeah. get a trash out of the trash can. You yell to the grip or, or the production assistant, throw trash all over this house. We need to make it look lived in, you know? So stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. And, but and you've uh, got to be resourceful as you. Yeah, know. absolutely. Yeah. And uh, most of my acting, you know, I, I started acting about six years ago and it's most of it been detective roles. And detective always has that notepad and that pen and they're taking notes. And so just about every gig, you know, I would do that and I would find something to do with the pen and like point it at them, you know, instead of, you know, instead of me pointing at them, I would use this almost like a weapon because like, like I'm a detective interrogating you. I'm not in the field. So my gun right now is not the weapon. It's my pen and paper. I'm taking notes. I'm building a case against you and I'm looking at you and I'm pointing at you, you know, blah, 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 blah. What did you do? Well, where was he? And I'm, and I'm pointing, you know, using this or it might've been the folder. I, you know, if I have a folder, I'm like, you know, this is, this is your life right here. This is this is your freedom right here. And if you don't, you know, start explaining all this stuff in this, and you're looking at this is part of that scene. And now this is something that I'm interacting with to uh, interact with them. And 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 I'm not, you know, my my only acting, you know, experience comes from uh, mil my military experience um, being and then military police. So it's always been law enforcement and military roles that I've acted. But I think it's important for me anyway, as far as an actor, it's three, three pretty simple rules. Remember in your lines, be comfortable in front of the camera. All actors have to be comfortable in front of the camera. Some aren't, and they use that to their benefit actually. But for me, it's remembering the lines, comfortable in front of the camera, connect to the character. And that's why I tell people, like, you know, just typecast me as law enforcement or military. I've, I, I've gotten a couple of direct phone calls. There wasn't even a casting notice. They didn't even start looking until they called me directly, which, which felt great. And they said, hey, listen, i got a detective role a couple of days. You want to do it? Absolutely. Because yeah. it's just, I'm totally fine with typecasting. I know where I fit in. I know where I'm good at. As far as crew-wise, it's, you know, director department or, or producer department. But, you know, it's... First off, listening to the director and, and taking the ego out, and I, and I think I said this to you before, is that the most important thing is the film. You know, and you've got a lot of actors trying to win an Oscar. You're not going to win an Oscar off of like a, a commercial or a short film. You know, this mm -hmm. is an independent thing. This is just for, you know, the love. You'll probably make a few bucks from it, but you're not going to win an Oscar. Just have fun with it and make, have fun with it and make a great film. Yeah. And next thing you know, hey, some awards might come out of it just because... On top of all that, when I go to audition, I go to auditions expecting to not get the audition. Because, you know, as, as you do this longer and longer and as, you, as you've been, um, you know, freelancing or acting professionally, working on films professionally, if I'm going to an audition, obviously, I didn't have a gig. I didn't have anything else going on that day. So if, if I got a day off, I'm going to go to this audition, I'm going to... I'm, I'm not going unprepared. I, I looked at the script that they sent me. I looked at the sides and memorized them. I connected to the character. I'm already comfortable in front of the auditioner like I am the camera. So I'm just going to kick it. But 
there's a whole bunch of factors I know already against me that are out of my control. They're probably not looking for somebody my age. If, if the casting notice, if the audition notice said, uh, you know, males, all ethnicities, you know, age 25 to 45, they're probably keeping that open just to keep their options, options open. But I'm sure the, the, the casting director has in mind someone they're looking for. And it's probably not me. So I'm going to go in there just thinking there's all these different reasons. I'm not going to get it. Just do it and relax and have fun with it. Next thing you know, you might get it. I didn't have anything else going on that day anyway. Right. But like you said, it's a lot of people get stuck in this box where they try too hard. Uh-huh. And you know, it maybe a little bit of experimentation. The reason why Kirby enthusiasm is so funny is I think a lot of it's outlined improvisation. So you know, they know what the beginning and the end is. And, you know, they know that, you know, a bottle of wine and a kid's doll and, uh, you know, poisoning someone's dog all has something to do with it. Right. But, the, but then they just go off on a tangent and they're yelling at each other and, and they're building on that outline. They're building on that end that they're trying to get to, but they're having fun with it, improvising, yelling at each other, goofing on each other, insulting each other, you know, whatever the case may be, being weird and, and dragging other elements from the set, other props maybe. Right, and, and, that, and that's uh, when, you, when you're, I always say, you gotta find out what your end game is, what your end, if you can get to the, a lot of times you're in a script, you may have experienced this, and I'm sure a lot of people have. The ending yet, that can be problematic because you're going to go on different tangents. And, and But if you know the ending early on or you can figure out how you're going to end this thing, then you, you get a better idea how to work towards it. Because then, again, you can introduce the players in Act 1, Act 2, and the, probably the conflict too. And then Act 2, the conflict sort of things start to evolve and – and there's all kinds of twists and turns, maybe, you know, and then, you know, then you get towards the latter part. It's like, who's going to win or, 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 or fail at the end here, at the end of this. And that's what we did with your can of love story. I took that same formula. You got bottle versus can. You introduce who they are at the beginning. And they got this conflict and the conflict goes on and on and on. And, you know, and then towards the end, you see who wins or fails. And so um, I think that, uh, a lot of people that do improvise like that, if you have a collaboration, you're lucky. Um, to, if you, you know, and that, and that makes for really cool experiments to get there. You know, yeah. you sort of flush them out as you start to write. Or if you're acting and doing improv, you know, you give me topics, there's, you know, there's people that can go off for hours. You know, and if you get the right chemistry with people, that's another thing too. You know, some people are very, you know, you've got method actors and you've got, you know, different kinds of actors that, you know, uh, and, and I know actors that are pretty scatterbrained that are, that are good, you know, and they're great when they're great, but talk about not knowing your lines, uh, you know, they, they always go off script. And uh, unless you're, you know who you're dealing with as a director ahead of time and saying, okay, I'm, I know this is the way it's going to be. It's like Phil Jackson trying to coach Dennis Rodman, right? He knew what he had. So Dennis had to go to, you know, to Vegas, you know, drink like a fish, but be ready for that 7.30 game in Chicago mm-hmm. the next night. Yeah. And he had to be willing to take that risk knowing who this person was, right? And uh, they did, and, and it worked. He was ready, game time, he was always ready. And so I think there's, there's different kinds of actors and as a director, producers, mostly the producer has to be ready. See, a lot of times I had to produce and direct out of necessity, because I don't have the luxury of hiring a director and saying, oh, like, you gotta get on the same page as, as the production here. Let's see what the chemistry's like. You know, we don't have that luxury in, in the yeah. film world. So we've got a lot, a lot of us have to produce and direct, as you know. So it's like, okay, who, who can I get a board that's going to have the same, like, like a team? And as I get older, you know, I'm 52, I, you know, I don't have time for assholes. You know, I want to be the biggest asshole in the set. I mean, and I say that because I don't think I am. I'm just saying if I, if I have to be and say, I got to make this decision. 
it's coming through me now. Otherwise, it's a collaboration the way we work with Film Brothers. That's what we do. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we bring people in. And, you know, it, it's funny because the beer can people now all have nicknames. And these are people that we really love. You know, we've got oh, my assistant for two years who now she lives in New Hampshire. And, but she'll come down and she'll hit the road anytime we need help. Uh, you know, Matt is texting me five in the morning and, you know, she's in her car and he does these group group texts and just with all these ideas, you know, like, and I'm trying to reel him in and she's like, what's please stop with all the texts. So he nicknames her cranky pants. What's up with cranky pants? So that's this. Then we got fancy pants. There's this woman, she's, she's, she's a little bit, you know, she drinks wine and she comes from a corporate background. We got then we got, uh, you know, we got crab cakes and we've got, you know, so we have all these people on our team now that sort of, you know, have the same sort of mentality that we can work with. And uh, it's become kind of a family of misfits and subcontractors. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, we're working all the time together every day and we have that luxury. It's like, well, I got to call up Cranky Pants. Where are you now? I'm in Ireland for, for a month. And I'm like, okay, will you be back on June 1st? You know, that kind of thing. And then we get ready for the projects that we're going to do. So, yeah, but it, it, it really, at this point, I don't have the time, energy, or years left to, to deal with the kind of delusion that is in this business, probably more than any business other than maybe politics. And uh, because, as you know, you know, people delusions of grandeur are out there I've, I've run into it over the years where people just feel like they are god's gift to filmmaking or whatever and i go that's great but they won't work with anybody you know and nobody wants to work with them because even if they're good at what they do and i find that sad for them because when you collaborate i feel that's when the magic happens you get two good actors that can collaborate you get a writer and a director or two writers together and then you can kind of collaborate and then make that come alive on the screen. That's just, you have to collaborate. You can't do that on your own. I don't think, I think you're just going to crash and burn and even good ones. You know, I've seen some really good filmmakers come and go. I mean, there's, and I've seen bad ones. I mean, it's, it's really wild. People will go out and say, I'm the pioneer for filmmaking. One guy said, this was 20 years ago, about seven years later, he was making my sub at Wawa. And, and it was it was an awkward thing when I went to grab my sandwich and I didn't feel like I wasn't feeling superior either. I felt badly about it. You yeah. know, I felt, but that's the kind of delusion that I've run into and not so much anymore because I just see it coming and I'm just like, yeah, let's just let this person go and we'll be in an audition or we, and I think that if you get really serious about this business, as you know, it's, you just can't waste your time. It's not like we've got a lot of time or money or energy or resources. So you sort of become a little bit cynical. At least I have. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's the producer in me, you know? Yeah. Kind of, okay, got that asshole out of there. I just try not to be too mean about it. But the, yeah, I, but there's nothing wrong with trying to keep a lot of levels of the production or the process simple. And if you're dealing with a big hothead, you know, you're going to complicate things, which is going to get in the way of the production, it's going to get in the way of the creative process. And like you said, collaboration first and, yeah. teamwork, and teamwork first. And well, I've had those as over the years, especially with movie, the movie part. You know, the parts when I'm doing my own thing with the videos, because you, you have more people and more people, you have more chance that somebody's going to, you know, you rub the wrong way or rub you the wrong way or two people aren't going to get along. You have to play referee while you're, you know, with these people, somebody else is a hothead on set. Somebody else is, you know, not a hothead. And there, I had that happen when I did a bigger production, Mayor Cupcake. We had Judd Nelson and Leah Thompson on set. And I was a producer and this other producer was very passive. The lead producer was, you know, and he would, and he, he's, and I said, look, let me, you want me to take care of this? You know, and he goes, yeah, yeah. Because there was, you know, he didn't want to confront this and, and, and he didn't want to mess this up. And then, so it was really a good collaboration between all of us. Cause I said, you handle the numbers, crunch them, do that. I'll be the people referee, mm -hmm. you know? And then, so it worked out well and we got it done. And, uh, but yeah, it's, 
it's tricky when you're dealing with people's emotions and, and expectations and of themselves and, and delusions. I say there's a lot of delusion. <laughs> I have this much delusion, I think. <laughs> but I think we all do. If we're going to get into the business, yeah, I think big moves, moves. you got to have something, right? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but some people are just off the charts, as you know. And, you know, but if they're not in it for the good of the project and it's their own ego, they just end up imploding. And I've had people on sets, this chart, I can't feel. I said, person's going to implode just give them time or give her time it's going to happen they're going to implode on their own you're not you don't have to worry about it. just do your job okay you know, and so you, it really becomes a lot of people sort of we'll call it babysitting but it's, it's kind of like babysitting it is kind of babysitting. well we kind of touched you kind of touched upon netflix is there anything that you're binge watching uh you know or binge reading any books series um movies? well my wife's the big book person you know i'm you know, I uh, I re read you know three books and I probably read the Cliff Notes and that was about it. <laughs> but um, I joke. But um, Netflix really, you know, over the last couple of years, and Matt and I have talked about it. It's really been saturated with a lot of uh, comedians and stand ups and stuff. And I haven't really. I get into documentaries. I like documentaries. That's what I've. I, I'm fascinated with them. And, you know, so I, I saw all the ones that came out since the pandemic, you know, the Tiger King ones and the follow-ups and the Epstein ones and the Dirty Money, you know, with the, I just watched the one with uh, with uh, Trump's son-in-law, you know. And so I, I really watch most of these. My wife will get into uh, more of shows, you know, a lot of the, the, the women type shows, the girly chick flick type stuff. And I'll go, I don't really want to watch it. I'm just, I'll hang out with you, you know. <laughs> so not a lot, really, honestly, um, oh, 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 unless it's a documentary and it's hot. You know, The Last Dance, of course, I'm a Jordan lover, so I've watched that whole thing. And, you know, so I, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm fascinated with people's lives and the psyche and all that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am watching, believe it or not, Parks and Rec again. <laughs> I, mean, I never watched it, but I got into it. Just like, okay, watch something funny. We need something lighthearted to this whole this thing. It's too much news. So we started to binge watch that a little bit. And, you know, it's just, I like comedy. And uh, and so I said, okay, I, I love The Office. The Office is probably my favorite of all time. I've watched the whole series five times over. Right. And, um, but I, wa I started watching some of this comedy, which inspires me because the new movie we're doing, the feature film that we just got funding for, and uh, the guy uh, has committed to, uh, is a comedy and it's a ridiculous comedy. It's Bottle versus Can again, but it's a fictitious feature length film. Um, so I'm, I'm watching a little more comedy, maybe to get inspired, you know, because sometimes, you know, with this pandemic, it's like, are we ever going to do it? You know, will I ever get out again and be able to do this? Will it be two years? Will it be next year? Will it be ever? That's daunting when I think about that, especially with children and school and my age. And, you know, there's lots, lots going on. And uh, so as far as binge watching, that's kind of where I am. Aubrey Plaza, by the way, who's in that, <laughs> a little side note, uh, who got big, if you know, I don't know if you know the show, but Aubrey Plaza's from Delaware. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so she, this is wild. When she was 16 and I did my first movie and I was auditioning for Franks and Wieners, I was a, a, a headhunter. I was a recruiter, a technical recruiter. And so I had my office there and I would do the auditions for a month or two through, you know, on the off hours there and bring people in. And Aubrey Plaza and her friend Neil Casey, who has since gone to L.A. and as a writer worked on some on some pretty big stuff. Uh, they come in for the audition just he has an accordion. She's wearing a chicken suit and they're 16 years old and they come walking in and I'm like, who are these two? Just out of, not, they didn't read the sides. You know, we had, they just come in like two nutcases and they start, he starts playing the accordion. She's dancing around and they were so funny and they were improv and everything. And I've had them audition the stuff. And I said, I got to put these two in the movie. And Frank Sweeney's like, like, we were already set locations. I said, I don't care. I haven't come this on this one Friday. We'll throw them in a booth at the restaurant, have them talk. And they did. They did the, 
improv, but I couldn't find anywhere to put it in, in the, in the edit. And this was my first film ever. And I cut her. <laughs> <laughs> so I joke and say, I cut a woman that went on Ellen and uh, was on IMDb, got the top probably 50 for a while or whatever. Yeah. I cut her out of my movie. And I've been struggling 20 years ever since. So I've got her cell number and I say, hey, you know, you want to do a film? She goes, send me the script. I probably can bypass her age and her agent might not like this. But so, so she's in it. So um, I'm actually hoping to, for this new movie to contact her and try to get her a cameo or something. You know? If we do, we might, we'll probably have to do maybe ultra low budget SAG, which is a whole nother set of issues to do. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm well aware I've done, of that. Yeah. I've done before too. And, you know, and so you gotta, you gotta deal with a lot, a lot if you do that, but it might be worth it if we get some star status. There's a couple other people we're looking at. Cause I won't do a movie anymore unless there's a star power. And I said that in 2006. I said, I'll never do a feature length film again, unless there's star power in it. And I've, and I've held true to that. So I've just done stuff that I could make money on or, or something that uh, was it, what didn't, t these expectations, this delusion went away in 2006. When I, I put, I had 24 investors in a movie I did at the Boys and Girls Club. I had Hillary Clinton, uh, Queen Latifah, Mark Wahlberg's people all on the hook for little tiny cameos I was gonna insert in this national version of the movie. And let's just say, you know, the uh, nonprofit that I was doing it with went dark and I just, I just lost interest in ever doing it again, unless there was star power. And I was close to getting star power if I had had the endorsement that they gave me at the beginning, if they'd given me support throughout and I just depended on that was going to happen. It did, you know, they, they had bigger fish to fry in their minds, I think so. So that's when I said star power only, or I'm not doing a feature ever again. So I'm trying to get Aubrey and there's a couple other people in LA that we're, we're in contact with to kind of insert. And if, if I can get them in a scene or two and get them out for a day or two and pay them for that, then it's all worth it. You know, they're going to need to be worked. Cause the thing about Netflix, as you know, they need content, all these streaming really need good content now. And then, now they're pulling stuff out of the, the B and C basket, it seems like, and editing it together and putting it out there just so they have fresh content. Uh, I think Bottle versus Can would be great content for them, especially if people have a beer in their hand, because in the, if this is the big thing, is we, we had a brewer brew the can that looks like him in the movie for the premiere. And people, hundreds of people, you know, we're all holding up toast in, in this big thing. So we feel if we can market that beer, which we're talking to another brewer now that's, you know, we're going to do something more regionally in our area and stream it. That could, that's a Netflix thing with a beer in your hand, sitting at home in your home theater. And that's right. kind of where we are with this bottle versus can. You talk about all the tentacles it might have with merchandise. And then if you see the bottle babes, there's four of these beautiful women that drape around the bottle, which was really a tough job for me to do. I have to say, thank God I'm married because <laughs> It might have got ugly. Who knows? Right. Four beautiful single women, and uh, you know, I, I like to think I could have, but uh, but anyway, there, there's merchandising there. You know, they we did profiles for these four uh, that they have their own sort of characters, and they can have their own lines, product lines. We talked to a jeweler and stuff like that. We work with so there's all these sort of sort of merchandising possibilities with this. And for different reasons, you know, people buy for different reasons, different markets, different demographics. So again, it's the sales and marketing hat I put on when I talk to my partner, is your, is your movie marketable? You know, and a lot of people say, yeah, well, action works or horror works. Well, okay, it might, but you know, in this industry, it's always changing. They're always saying, well, six months now it's family, family, musicals or something right this is yeah. what they used to say when you would query them and stuff you know years ago six months it changes again my thing is i think that filmmakers need to create their own markets and say what am i going to do with this before i even make the movie what am i going to do with it not crowdfunding and putting it on thinking and beg what i call begging for money you know yeah. if somebody look if, if, if your house burned down or you're sick you don't have insurance and you say, I need to go fund me for that. Yeah. To do a movie, 
and stuff like that. I find it like, yeah, some people might you reach out to your, but the average person's not going to sit there and give you money to make your own saying, this is such a great idea. There's, I used to tell my brother, I said, there's drug addicts that have great ideas, but they don't put anything to action, you know? And so I think there's that sort of, that marketing thing that needs to, and especially nowadays, Glenn, right? Because here we are on Zoom. What can I do now to sort of monetize something so I can at least survive? Yeah. Not like, not like, oh, I got to make millions with this. And so when people call me, I get a call probably once a month. Not as much since the pandemic, but hey, I got an idea for a movie. I, I Googled you guys and I'm in the area and I like to talk. And I go, what's your expectations? What do you want to see happen with this movie? That's one of the first things I ask. Well, you know, I'd like to see it in theaters or I'd like to, and then you just got to get down to reality, you know, or and I'm just like, okay, all right. You know, and I don't want to squash somebody's dream ever. Then I say, okay, well, what about doing a short film? What if you did one 10 minutes and kind of cut your teeth on that and you could do it for a couple thousand bucks or whatever. And then what if you streamed it on your own just to get it out there? Would that be, oh no, I need this feature line. I go, well, let me know when you get the money because I'm not an executive producer. <laughs> you know, I'm a line producer. I'd be happy to do it for you once you can secure that. But most of the time they're asking for money. They're or saying, how can you fund my idea? And I go, yeah, ideas are a dime a dozen, man. You know, and it might be a great idea. There's been great ones come across. So, you know, there's a lot of that. And I think that's sort of uh, gets uh, depressing for some people. But I'm like, look, even if it's simple, I've had people go out, spend four or $5,000 on a short film, pack a theater, make money, pack in the theater at 10, 15, $20 a pop, have a big event and say, damn. And now I got a, a finished product. That's been my formula, Glenn. My formula is to work with new filmmakers and say, I don't, whatever the number is, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to cost you X. It's usually not a ton of money. And they put it out there and they've actually made money at the event. Mm -hmm. And now that's tough to do because you can't do these in, in, house events right now you know i have a film festival in my 12th year where i host a film festival of short films it's called film brothers festival of shorts i love doing it we're we're sold out every event every time and i can't do it i've had to cancel it three more times since it started i keep putting the date ahead and data it was already sold out i had sponsors and everything so yeah it's it's that's the tricky part how can we survive this well you're gonna have to work another job probably and keep your passion going i mean that's what i did the joke was i did movies and moving i, I had I moved furniture for 10 years my first 10 years and then i did movies and that was the joke movies are moving this week and uh a guy said to me gordon he goes didn't i see you with like when we went to that premiere down in newark there was like 500 people there, and you were hosting it that was great and all that. Yeah, yeah. Then I see you on Monday driving a, a box rider truck. <laughs> yeah. And I go, yeah, man, I had to, I had to pay the bills. That certainly wasn't going to pay the bills. I did yeah. that for 10 years. And, uh, you know, so people would ask me, you know, what, what would you do? And all I said, yeah, you can move to New York or LA. Go ahead. You know, I worked on School of Rock. I, I was uh, a guy I worked with in Atlanta in 96, uh, Mike Brode. He worked on Wise Guy. It was like an 80s detective show. He yeah. was one of the producers. And I worked with him as a, sort of his assistant in, at the Olympics. We did a, a, a block party thing. It was a big production. We blocked off the streets for two weeks through whatever it was. It was really exciting and a lot of hard work. And he goes, you want to be in show business? You want to be in show? I said, not really. At the time, I had no thoughts of being a filmmaker. This was 96. And so, but I always, in my mind, I thought, he's connected so i said as in 2002 i guess i said hey man i just emailed him or called him whatever i said let me see what this guy's really all about i said give me a job at hollywood hollywood production he goes you want a job hollywood production? i said yeah he says uh it's going to be low pay low level i said i don't care in a week i had an interview in uh the greenwich village they had like a makeshift office 
for, mm -hmm. for rock production. And I'm in there. I'm like, this guy was no bullshit. I get the interview and they ask me what I wanted to do. And I'm like, yeah, and I don't really want to be the director. Well, they loved hearing that because, you know, then I, I wasn't going to be a threat to the people there, right? Because all these people coming in with their resumes, oh, we'll be in touch. I'm like, they're not going to be in touch with you, but I'm going to get a job. And I did. It was a production assistant job. Low, I mean, it didn't, didn't even pay the tolls for me driving up from Delaware, getting through the tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel. But I, but I went to just experience it at the time. This was, you know, fairly early in my, in my days. And uh, it was a shit show, man. It was like, it was like people were like so paranoid on the set because they were in their zones, you know, in their lanes. And if, if you even tried to talk to them about it, it was just like, it was nuts. And the egos were incredible, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was just thinking to myself, I've already made three films. I don't circle with any people. I'm thinking in my mind, right? And then, real quick story, I, it was cold as ice. And we're in like Staten Island. And we're in like Jersey and Queens, and different, different parts. And I'm, I'm here and I'm freezing. And the money they wasted on just craft snacks, I could have made a movie with. I'm looking at the price tags. I mean, it's like they're in the dirt. I mean, it's just the waste, right? Yeah. Well, um, I get a call on the radio and you'll say, Gordon, I'll go to one. And, and I would go, go ahead. It would be like a second. Well, my, my, my uh, thing got tied up, my walkie in my big long jacket because it was freezing cold. And it took me like four seconds. And I said, go ahead. Later, they come down, they like sit me down. They start to reprimand. You have to be a little quicker when we call you. And I didn't want to get into this whole like, hey, you know, it got like I was making an excuse. I said, I just took it right in front of Jack Black. <laughs> Jack Black looked at me like with pure empathy saying, I'm like, where these people came from? But I'm going back home. I'm going back to Delaware and I'm going to make another movie. And I did. And it really motivated me to say, I don't want to be part of this. It's not saying I hate Hollywood and I, you know, I just don't want to be part of that kind of production that seemed to me to be so dysfunctional in a lot of ways. Now they got stuff done because they had resources and did everything like that. But that was, that was the key point for me to realize that I wanted, I didn't mind being in little crappy Delaware making films and I felt good about it. You know what I mean? I felt good about what I was doing. I didn't have, they called me back. They called me to go work in Connecticut on a new production. Then I'm like, I'm like back there. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting, you know, so that's been sort of my path, you know, going in, uh, in the Hollywood scene, you know, and I worked with Judd Nelson and Leah Thompson, which at, at one time they were, you know, they were fairly big stars and they had big movies and stuff. And it's just a whole nother level of, you know, expectations, what they had. You know, and they come to work on a small film and then, you know, you always know that they're thinking, oh, this crappy little film, you know, this is junior high, this is Bush League, you know. And, and, so, and so you try to make it, I tried to make it where they felt like they were the stars, you know, pumped them up without kissing their ass too much. So I, I, I wouldn't do that. But, uh, you know, once Leah, we got a trailer, we'd spend 3000 for it. Judd had to have one. So we had to go get a trailer for him, <laughs> spend three grand on that. <laughs> few weeks but you know we did it you know we did so that was a production i worked on which i'm i'm proud of that it was mayor cupcake it was called and it, it was a film it was on showtime and netflix and you know it was done fairly inexpensively uh but it had somewhat of a budget a lawyer in uh in dewey beach area he uh he made it and i, I was one of the producers of that so what else can i can we talk about is there anything else <laughs> no i don't know I'm just no, happy. but uh, no, I had I, I had pretty much the same exact radio uh, issue as a, I was a location PA on National Treasure Two, and I think they were shooting for about a week or two at the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress in DC, and so I was working on that, and for some reason the the, the radios were glitching out, and they said, okay, you turn yours off, and I turned mine off, and there was still no issue. And they just went down each, each one of these location PAs because they thought it was us for some reason. Mm -hmm. And the AD the AD's losing his mind. 
And so the location manager was this, you know, kiss ass. She was from, I guess, LA also. So when she came to DC, she hired a, uh, a location QPA and then he hired all of these location PAs. And basically what we did was, long story short, our job was to say, you know, put, uh, oh, what's this called? Layout board on the floor. Cause we're at the Smithsonian, we're at the Library of Congress. So it's, you know, a national landmark. So we had to put layout board on the floors. So we had to bubble wrap all the railings and they truck in gear in and out. And, you know, the scene is, you know, uh, Nick Cage's character was going to the Library of Congress to steal Abraham Lincoln's diary to find a clue yeah, or something. The delicate stuff, they didn't want to mess up. So all that stuff, they, they you know, got to protect all this stuff. So they went to the whole location department. We're turning it off. We all turned off our radio. So he still, still hears the glitch. And they're like, no, just get rid of your radio. And I'm thinking to myself, like, here we go. Here's the bullshit. And so they said, you know, they told me and another guy, you know, block off these elevators so that they can't go up this side, these, these elevators. They can only go up. So I'm directing these people and they're giving me eyes. And I'm like, just do it. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to start, you know, taking this Hollywood attitude from you. And they're like getting puffy and puffy. I'm like, just go down there. And, and then an hour later, the location manager, the lady from L.A., comes down trying to reprimand us. Why are you not answering your calls? I mean, there is no service in here. That is why we have radios. Right. Our radios weren't the issue. Our radios weren't the issue with the radio problems, yet you still took our radios. Yeah. And you're trying to text me in a building with zero service. Yeah, they, got, you, they got slabs of stone about that thick that you can't even get, get through. What do you think is the problem, man? Yeah. And so she, so she tells this other guy, like, I don't think Glenn should come back because, you know, he's, I think he's a little uh, sneaky. He's a little cheeky. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I tell you, everybody, that's what I'm saying. Everybody felt threatened when you get to a certain level. Everybody feels threatened. For the, I mean, I would try to talk to people at lunch. I'm so tell me what, you know, like trying to, you know, I had a conversation. They're literally, they got their food and they're like this, you know, with, you know, eating the food, you know, like, like I'm going to steal their food too. And I'm just like, this is just a, an atmosphere. Is, to me, it's just dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to be part of it. And, uh, you know, it was funny because one of my jobs one day, they said, okay, we have a lot of background actors, extras for this scene. And what I need you to do is go down there and sort of man the, uh, the, the craft services. And anybody that are the backgrounds cannot eat off of that buffet. Now you got people coming down, they're probably making 15 bucks or whatever it is they're making, I'm thinking in my mind. And you're gonna give them, I think it was, I don't even think they were getting like a sandwich or anything, you know? And they're gonna sit there for three hours to possibly get their face on there. And you can't just set up some sort, of, you're spending 20 million bucks on this. I see that craft services that for, are for the regulars, you know, that are the union, I guess, and all, that yeah. are basically in the dirt. I mean, stuff with price tags on it of fifteen, twenty dollars. It's in the in the dirt, and you can't just say, you know what? Let's make people. They didn't care. It was, it. and I had to do the dirty work. I had to be the one saying, no, you can't, because if they were coming up thinking, you know, I could, I'm part of this. I get at least to eat. I mean, in independent film, you work for food at least. Right? Yeah. We mm -hmm. couldn't. They didn't even get whatever they were getting paid. I don't know. You know, some of them are background people who have. Sad cards, you know, right. they do, but uh, yeah, they were really, and I was like, Man, I gotta do this dirty work today, yeah. And I just had another oh, that's what it was. I was, I was AD on an ultra low budget TV pilot, and I was able to get a whole slew of PAs for internships from Towson University, which you know, we were shooting, I don't know, five miles from the university, and so I said, Listen. I could have as many as, you know, five PAs. We work on their schedule if they want to be on set. And, and the producer says to me, I only want a key PA and two PAs per day because we can't afford the catering. And I said, the catering, you're doing buffet style. You're doing buffet style. So they're going to scoop their own plates. So you could get, if you, if you add 20 or $30 more a day to the catering, you're essentially paying these PAs cash, three dollars a day to work on, on to work, right? And they're going to do it because I'm 
ma'am, I'm doing I'm doing all the, the, the Towson internship credit paperwork for them. I know the professor, I've worked with the professor for years. He right. sent me all these guys, let's have 10 PAs, free PAs on set to, to move shit quicker. No, we can't afford the catering. How can you not afford the catering? You gotta think of the think think of the think of the back end. You're probably gonna spend an extra thirty dollars a day. That's three dollars a person. You're you're basically giving them three dollars a day to work on the film. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing because a lot of these interns too, they and I don't I don't know if it goes state by state, but I don't know if it's frowned upon or might even be illegal to not pay an intern something. Um, I, I don't, I remember something coming up where, and, and you know what, it's, it's interesting because it, 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 we bring this up because there's production companies that I know of, uh, not, I, I don't follow, I don't get in people's way much anymore, but I used to be more in the loop or in my area with who was who. I don't care anymore. I, at one point I just like, I don't care. Oh, they're a production company. I don't care. I don't know them. If they're nice people, I'll talk to them i might collaborate with them but i don't seek them out you know i'm not trying to be part of this network anymore especially after i was called the sham wow guy by a place a, a network that i created with these people and i helped actually promote it and got a lot of people in, in there and i was i was really pissed about that so i sort of just said you know whatever but there are there are production companies that would get interns from the colleges and Philadelphia Art Institute or wherever, even NYU and stuff like that. And they'd have them like cleaning up their friggin' offices and stuff. I said, they're not janitors here. You know, I want you to clean the bathrooms. I would, so I would tell them when they come in, I said, this is what I can offer you. It's not glamorous. It's not, there's a lot of sort of hurry up and wait. You know, if you want to kind of be over the shoulder and learn the business side of it, I think that could be really beneficial. If you just want to learn how to edit or shoot and stuff, and that's what you want to do, or you're an actor, then that's another story. I may not be able to help you on a consistent basis. It's the way this works. People call all the time say, you know, I just, they, there was a, there was a, there was a, a place around here, a college that was giving out these video certificates or degrees or whatever in video production stuff. They, had, they didn't tee these people up for jobs. They didn't train them how to, how to, um, how to be a business person or network. They, these poor kids were paying money and then they're calling me saying, um, are you hiring? And I go, nobody's hiring. Everybody's subcontractors in this business. They're feeding yeah. you a line of bullshit. Yeah. Go back and learn business. You want to learn networking? You want to learn? Be re and, you know, you tell a kid 19 years old who had a dream to be a filmmaker that they got to now go shake hands with people and stuff like that. They're petrified. Yeah. They don't know how to even do that. They're just basically learning life. Yeah. I, I was really pissed off locally at, you know, a couple places that would feed them this kind of, you're going to have, this is a great, you know, video you didn't teach him shit. Yeah. My editor, my one of my editors who still works with me, said, "And Gordon, in two hours on a on a we did a, a, a Skype or thing at the time, I learned more than I did in six months of my thing because they were teaching out of a book, had him go look at an Orson Welles movie, movie, and then you know, whatever else they did. Mm -hmm. And I find that really um, disturbing." And it's probably not happening as much anymore because I think people were wising up to it. That it's just, you know, there was nothing behind it. It was like, you know, here's a certificate, you know, that doesn't really mean anything. I said, what did I really learn? I learned some theory. Yeah. And when, yeah. I, at, uh, when I was in college, I took an editing course. And in 95, a film called Heat came out with Pacino and De Niro. Yeah, sure. By far, still probably my number one favorite film of all time i am a, yes i'm a kid i have a number one favorite film it's heat and it's and it's just about everything in a film you'd ever want and so i must have seen that movie a hundred times so they're using the diner scene if you if you if you're familiar with Heat, the diner scene where pacino de niro finally meet face to face they're having a conversation in the diner and they're saying they're using this as an editing part of the editing course to show because the, the, the rumor was they were never on set together, and yet they were able to piece this scene 
together. And it's a powerful scene. And I raised my hand. I said, actually, they, they were on set together. There's photos of it. You know, there's photos online. There's a whole documentary on the DVD about their, how, how they're on set together. Right. And they're like, no, they weren't on set together. I'm like, they were. Mm -hmm. you, you, the whole, the whole, your whole basis behind editing, using this scene as editing, is actually, in real world, ass backwards. They have shots of, of two shots of them sitting here and here talking. Mm -hmm. Michael Mann is quoted on the behind the scenes making or the commentary of Keith. For some reason, we just wanted to do the over the shoulder, the dirty shots. We never used the two shot for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And I think there is like this quick take of that two shot in the film. And they're like, oh no, that's CGI. I'm like, no, it's not, bro. Mm -hmm. You guys are teaching some bullshit here. Yeah. I'm telling you, I know this movie. I could, I could, I could stand here right now and quote this movie from beginning to end. I've seen the movie over a hundred times. I know the behind the scenes. I know, you know, all the commentary. I know everything about this movie. This movie made me want to become a filmmaker. You are wrong right now. And so there's little things like that. But there needs to be, you're absolutely right. There needs to be networking 101. There needs to be a class of networking 101, marketing 101 for filmmakers. There needs to be like business strategy, you know, you know, a quick class or two for specifically for filmmakers for networking, marketing, business strategy, pitching, you know, yep. something something along those lines. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was lucky coming out of coming out of Towson, and I think, you know, aside from a few of those little hiccups, um, you know, Towson was great. Uh, uh, you know, college, great, great educational experience. I would highly, if my kid wants to get into filmmaking, if they still have the EMF department, I would highly suggest, hey, go to Towson, do EMF. I was lucky, six, maybe four to six months out of graduating. You no, know, five months after, five months right after graduation, I got a job at Discovery Channel in Silver Spring. I was there for four years. All my networking, all my colleagues, we started to like build and kind of like network and, and fan out and spider web from there. And then was the rise of Craigslist Staff Me Up Production Hub. And then the, and, and then the website, uh, you know, the crewing up websites and the uh, backstage and all the, all, the, all the staffing up and crewing up and, and casting websites, which are now turning into apps. But that, and then YouTube was the rise of YouTube. So I think I just got like that lucky little bridge of to go to the Discovery Channel start building a network there in person, hands on. Right. Hey, hey, you guys want to shoot this music video? Hey, you guys want to shoot a little short film? Somebody from Towson called me. I made, I made a network at Towson. And I think what's important, you know, I, I agree with you a lot, but what, what people need to do in, I mean, especially with today's technology, it's 2020. If you're going to go to film school, you know, make your film and pump it out there and show people what you're made of. And that's your network. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, when you graduated and when I graduated, it was tough, man. I think Google had just had just popped up, maybe. Or at least there was Yahoo, and you were able to, you know, look up things then. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's a whole nother. I mean, you're freezing up a little bit, Gordon. You stop and What's that? Oh, okay. You're good. You were free. You, you were free. You were freezing up and sticking a little bit. Okay. You're back. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I was talking about, yeah, you can get yourself out there. And I think it's, you know, I, I mean, it's really tricky because I think you, the trick is not to be too obnoxious and be out there like where you're just, you're just, I think there you got to spend a little money, especially if you're using like a Facebook or some pay thing to boost ads and boost materials or whatever. And they're so tough. I mean, I just had my bottle versus cam rejected yesterday twice. I rewrote it, certain keywords and algorithms and stuff like that just throw things off. It makes it even tougher. I'm just trying to ask for an actor. And it's so funny. Facebook is, it's so ridiculous, really. Uh, let me just get on my soapbox here about Facebook, right? They're really become a necessary thing for us in a lot of ways in life, if, if you really want to connect out there. But, uh, you know, they'll take money for political ads, which now they say they're not going to, they're going to go dark, you know, around election time. Yet, 
I try to boost an ad to say actor wanted. And if I have the word male in there or age, it's discrimination because it's a job offer. I go, well, guess what, Facebook? You can discriminate in the movies because there's no way a 500 pound white man is gonna play something where I need a black woman who's 18 years old. Sorry, I can discriminate. I'm not being racist. Oh God, all right. But that's what they do. You know, they set yeah. up these keywords and suddenly it's you, uh, uh, you know, going against our policies and, you know, God forbid trying to get a live person and say, hey, you know, no, I can discriminate. This is the movies. That's what you do. This is not discrimination. This is casting. <laughs> it's casting, right? Yeah, I want... And, um, and you know what they do, though? They still take my money. They still have, they have taken my money. If Facebook people are out there, you've taken my money twice, and probably yesterday, my 50 bucks or whatever, is going to be taken again, and I, God forbid trying to get it back. I'm going to have to go to my bank and say and dispute the charge because they will never respond or credit me the money. Yeah. They take the money automatically and then they go reject it. Do you refund Facebook when you reject? Having for me. Sorry, I'm all so fun. No, it makes sense. I agree. It makes sense. And, and, and you hit the nail on the head. Like, I'm not going to cast a fat 50 year old white man for an 18 year old black woman. Right. Yeah, I need it. It's necessary for the story. What? And why, oh, but, 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 but now I'm paying money, and now I gotta. So if I make it open ended, now I gotta sip and do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Yeah, that's oh. exactly what happens too. Control, you? control F. Yeah. Control, control F. And you know this. Every time you put out something, even if you put, I need a 45 year old white guy that is left handed. Right-handers, women that are 20 years old, and guy, everything comes anyway. Yeah. So if you have to generalize it down to the, the minute generalization so you don't piss off somebody or they don't say Facebook doesn't feel like we're discriminating, we're allowing this, yet you'll take money from some of the biggest politicians there are. Yeah. Let's get real here. <laughs> you know, it's just funny. I find it amusing. I mean, I'm not even going to get upset about it. I'm just sort of like, whatever. Maybe I'll get my money back. So, <laughs> well, um, I mean, we pretty much touched upon you know just about everything that uh, I have listed for the show. But what you know, I guess you, you kind of touched upon it now. Here with Facebook, what is what's what would be your view of the new normal? The what? The new normal. God, that's a good question. I mean. You know, I, I'd like to think that we're going to be out of this by the time this see, the, the winter's done and next spring we're back in action. You know, I'd like to be an optimist like that. I really would. But I just don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. I think it's probably a hybrid of what we're doing now where, you know, you, you're going to, if you really want to take the risk. And like in, in this case, I've got this movie. It's fully funded. We're ready to rock and roll. And then it's just a matter of can we get out there and do that? Will they allow us? Will the state, you know, allow us to have that kind of gathering or will we have to have, I don't know. Um, but in, as far as filmmaking, the new normal is um, just stay busy, you know, small projects and stuff like that. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, luckily I've, I've got some savings and stuff like that. And, and uh, my wife works and, you know, we, we've hustled enough to, to get, get by here. Um, we're lucky. A lot of people aren't. Um, but I, I don't, I can't answer that question. I just don't know yet what it's going to look like. Um, it's definitely, uh, especially with children being home and doing the schooling. I, I hear my son up there screaming now uh, about something because he doesn't want to get on. He's in kindergarten. All that has really thrown me personally into more of a role at home. So I'm doing less work. Plus yeah. people aren't, you know, in the video productions, which I do mostly, they're not, uh, people are worried, you know, to get out there and do interviews with people. A lot of clients have gone dark. Um, people don't have money, you know, right now. Um, so 
I, I can't answer it, man. I wish I, I wish I knew. It's I'm living it day by day at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I get you. Um, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this you know, a million times on, on the show, but uh, actually, what it was this? this is episode 62, so I definitely mentioned it 63 times that uh, you know, me and the wife uh, had a kid in February, and so. You know, we were had, we heard all the rumblings about COVID and then it hit and quarantine and and uh, I think just generally for me the new normal is to it's to, to look look at the positive more than the negatives. You know, of course we have to we have to work. we have to adjust, improvise, and adapt. Um, but you know, it's been great. Um, me and the wife have just been hands on. You know, 24 7 with the kid, and, and now we're taking the kid to daycare because she's back to she's a Zoom teacher and she's a, she's a third grade teacher, so she's been you know, teaching on Zoom. And, and, uh, and I tried to start this podcast and do a lot of telework and live streaming, but you know, before then it was just you know, it's trading them, trading them, or it was just both of us, just hands on with like the micro. I'm sure when you were when, when you were younger, when I was younger, you know, what we heard from our parents or from our grandparents was. Uh, when 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 someone started crawling and someone started walking, the first word, uh, you know, stuff like that. And for us, it's just the micro evolution. You know, we're seeing coos turning into cackles, turning into actual giggles, turning into full blown laughs. Right. We're start. We're starting to see. We're, he's doing all the squirming now. You know, like right. the rest of them, the squirming. He's starting to start to plank, and he's starting to work his muscles. It looks like he's about to crawl, and from crawling, he's looking like he's about to walk. Yeah. It's like those micro evolutions that we're really able to just really absorb and enjoy. And I think for us, it's a bigger blessing than it is a curse when it comes to it. Well, I think so too. Ours, ours is, you know, it's brought my wife and I together. I know there's people that have broke up and, and we're getting divorced or, you know, from this too. I mean, but I think in our case, I mean, luckily we were, we were our foundation was pretty good. And uh, we had rough times when we first got married, you know, like everybody does probably, or a lot of people do anyway. And um, now this, this, this COVID thing has actually brought us together and forced us to really listen more and be more patient and, uh, or you're going to implode in your own home, you know? So it's kind of like, it's, it's really forced our hand to do good things together and really, uh, care for each other as a family. So I think uh, in that way, I mean, if, as long as we can dodge getting sick, um, like uh, some people unfortunately haven't, uh, you know, it, it has been a blessing for us too, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, to close out, any socials, links, plugs you want to put out there? Well, I would just go to Beer Can of Love Story because that's our latest thing. Um, and, uh, you can see the trailer. It's a fun couple minutes of what the story is all about. It's a half hour short film that we want to hit the road again. Uh, if we can, if not, we want to stream it. We're meeting with a brewer on Wednesday, a new brewer who's in the movie, Tom Arnold with Locust Lane, who is a Pennsylvania brewer, does a lot of Penn State stuff. He goes the whole, up to Pittsburgh and everything down to Philly area. And uh, we're going to talk about, you know, making a beer again and putting it out there uh, with the movie for a couple bucks, watch the movie and then and, and uh, get some of this beer, especially in the Pennsylvania area. Now, nationally, we'd like to extend that. I mean, the, the plan is, is to get it everywhere, you know, and uh, because we feel this is a perfect streaming movie with a beer. So, uh, you know, go to, I would say that's my plug right now. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram and Twitter too. So it's just bottle versus can. If you put that in or, or beer can, a love story is the site. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Gordon Del Giorno, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, sharing your films, sharing your stories and uh, all your advice and stuff like that. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. To, uh, to my viewers out there, I hope I've earned the privilege of your time and viewership. I know my guest has. Gordon, again, thanks thanks so much. Uh, beer can, a love story. Bottle versus can. All the links in the description below. Check out all this stuff. And until then, see you next time. Take care.